So welcome to the AIA St. Louis Scholarship Trust Lecture. The St. Louis chapter of the American Institute of Architects and the Washington University School of Architecture have been inextricably linked since the turn of the century with AIA St. Louis providing ongoing engagement and support. In recent years, alumni and friends in AIA St. Louis have generously supported the Sam Fox Schools College of Architecture and Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Design to include scholarship support and sponsorship of today's AIA St. Louis Scholarship Trust Lecture. We are so grateful for their engagement in the Sam Fox School and for the opportunity to bring outstanding professionals in our field to share their expertise with our students and community. In particular, thank you to the current AIA St. Louis board members, Grace Corbin, Bob Winters, David Polson, Carl Grice, and John Berenzen. Before we start, I also want to mention that those of you who are seeking AIA continuing education credit, if you wouldn't mind sending a chat to Chandler Arends with your name, um, we will go ahead and process those requests. Um, you can send that chat to Chandler in a private chat, or you can just send it to the general um, chat as well. He'll be monitoring. So it is now my pleasure to welcome Deborah Burke, Dean of Yale School of Architecture and founder of Deborah Burke Architects in New York. She continues the tradition of Yale Dean practitioners, distinguishing herself as the first woman to hold this position. Deborah Burke began her architectural career during the 1970s and 80s at a time of limited female architects. Founding her practice in New York City in 1982, Deborah was simultaneously an adjunct professor at Yale University starting in 1987. Maintaining an architectural practice while commuting to teach undoubtedly posed challenges, yet also defined her practice aspirations. In 2013, she received the first Berkeley Roop Award given by the University of California at Berkeley to a distinguished practitioner and academic who has made a significant contribution to promoting the advancement of women in the field of architecture and whose work emphasizes a commitment to sustainability and the community. I should mention that Deborah is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a trustee and vice president of the Urban Design Forum. She served as a trustee and vice president of Design NYC, held positions as the founding trustee of New York City's Design Trust for Public Space, trustee of the National Building Museum, chair of the Board of Advisors for the Buell Center of the Study of American Architecture at Columbia University, and vice president of the AIA New York chapter. In 2017, her firm received the National Design Award from Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian, Smithsonian Design Museum. A graduate of RISD and the City University of New York, Deborah received her Bachelor of Fine Arts, Bachelor of Architecture, and Master of Urban Planning and Urban Design. In 2005, RISD awarded her an honorary doctorate of fine arts. For me, Deborah Burke is a living legend. Besides knowing her through built work, she has touched lives that have touched many of ours over the decades. I imagine her sphere of influence resulting in a network of inspirational stories. One such connection is through RISD professor Judith Woolen, who recalled her <laughs> as a young student full of ambition and weighty sense of responsibility. Professor Woolen remembers teaching generations of students that a singular iconic status work is non-essential. Instead, embrace the joy of a thoughtful and evolving practice. And she said, I think as a lesson to those of her that were listening to the story, not all projects need to be new inventions or the Michelangelo of architecture. Good projects will stand on their own. This retelling of a lesson to the younger Deborah Burke resonated with me during her talks at the Yale Lecture Series when she spoke earlier in August and it was called Every Day 2020. Dean Burke spoke of the matter of fact eloquence um, in architecture for the greater good, elevating her colleagues work to model a more diverse and humane definition of successful practice. Paraphrasing Burke's words from a book, Architecture of the Everyday, 
We exist in a culture where celebrities have replaced heroes, 15 minutes of fame valued over a lifetime of patient work. In this climate, the architect must become a celebrity to gain the opportunity to build. What should architects do instead? A simple and direct response. Acknowledge the needs of the many rather than the few. Address diversity of class, race, culture, and gender. Design without allegiance to a priori architectural styles or formulas. In closing, Professor Burke was a Pritzker Prize jury member this year, a member of the committee selecting Grafton Architects. I cannot help but think and connect the words of Yvonne and Shelley's recent commencement address to reflect on her own built work and educational legacy. In particular, their term, new geography, an environment at one with the natural world and a reality where imagined places prioritize humanity over economy. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Burke to our lecture series, an exceptionally inspiring educator and practitioner the stories continue and we thank her for being with us this evening. Welcome. Well, thanks Heather, that was incredibly nice of you. I really appreciate it. Um, as I said to you earlier, I'm sorry I'm not with you on campus. You owe me a great dinner in one of St. Louis's great restaurants when I do get out there. Um, I want to greet everybody as well, academic colleagues, professional colleagues, and students, and also really give a shout out to AIA St. Louis Scholarship Trust. Um, thanks for sponsoring this lecture. Many architects I admire have given this lecture in years past, and I think I can say for everybody, certainly all of the speakers, uh, over the years, uh, a collective uh, belief in the necessity of scholarship support for architecture students always, and I would say, especially now. So, and Heather, thank you also for mentioning my lecture earlier this year. Some of, you'll see some of it again tonight. It's sort of woven into a uh, Wash U lecture, but uh, there are themes that remain relevant. Um, now, when I was asked what the title of my talk was going to be, I think I said back then what I typically say, because you asked me a long time ago, which is the easiest thing to always say, which is current work. Um, I, that's the never fail lecture title, right, for the one you haven't written yet. Um, but I realized that as I was actually working on this, that a much better title is now. Uh, these are crazy times, very, very difficult times. And um, now never felt more present, I think, uh, than right now, at least um, in my lifetime. Um, as you know, this year is a very different year and we don't get to go to lectures or movies or, or much of anything actually. Um, and even though these headlines are from a few months ago, um, you all know that there is a lot going on from the pandemic to Black Lives Matter and social activism to immigration policies to the upcoming election. Uh, we have a lot on our minds. And so, although I am calling this now, as Heather alluded to, I am first going to go back to 1997 and start by taking you with me on a reevaluation of my thought process since then. So you're gonna see a bunch of self-criticism here. In 1997, Stephen Harris and I edited a small volume of essays called Architecture of the Everyday. It was published by Princeton Architectural Press and it included articles by Mary McLeod, Joan Ackman, Peter Halley, Mabel Wilson and Peggy Deemer among others, as well as photographs by Gregory Crutzen and design projects by Sheila de Bretville and Mary Ann Ray. And at the very back of the volume, there is a short essay by me, um, almost more of a manifesto, I would say. It was titled Thoughts on the Everyday. And right now seemed like a good time to go back, find my copy on my shelf and reconsider this, what I wrote as I thought about what regular life and normal life and even extraordinary life uh, should look like now. 
And I do start the essay by saying we exist in a culture where heroes have been replaced by celebrities and 15 minutes of fame are valued over a lifetime of work. And in this climate, the architect must become a celebrity in order to gain the opportunity to build, um, in order to become established as a critical force. And those who do build tend to produce signature buildings designed to attract the attention of the media and sustain the public's focus. For under these rules, architecture can only emanate from the hand of a brand name architect. The built environment is strewn with these high profile celebrity products, heroic gestures neither made nor commissioned by heroes. Now, I said that in 1997, and if anything, the situation has only gotten more pronounced and in my opinion, significantly worse. So as Heather just said, and I will say again, in the essay I wrote, what should the architect do instead? A simple and direct response, acknowledge the needs of the many rather than the few, address diversity of class, race, culture, and gender, design without allegiance to a priori architectural styles and formulas, and with concern for program and construction. Now that directive remains true today, and of it too can be said uh, to have only become more pressing and necessary. And the fact that architecture has made so little progress since 1997 is a disgrace, I think, um, and perhaps contributes to aspects of the many difficult conditions that we are experiencing today, at, at least those that relate to the built environment. So a bit of a backstory here. Uh, the initial impetus to search for a definition of an architecture of the everyday evolved from an ongoing conversation Stephen Harris and I had as we drove back and forth to New Haven from New York. Uh, we drove on the Merritt Parkway and on Interstate 95. We were friends from college, so we had familiar conversations and we gossiped a bit. Uh, and we talked a lot about the everyday because it was the perfect place to do that. But over the years of our shared commute, those nameless food and fuel stops you just saw became McDonald's and mobile stations, a uh, transformation to a kind of name brandedness, somebody somewhere in some turnpike authority had apparently sanctioned. And similarly, the exclusive suburban residential developments just off the highway grew ever more extravagant as the ready dollars of the 1980s purchased houses that were truly absurd amalgams of aspirational imagery and bombastic size. And our ongoing observations seem to find that the banal landscape, the fuel for our conversation on the everyday was each day actually becoming less anonymous, less anonymous, excuse me, and certainly less banal. So in my essay, I went on to list 11 points. I felt described this architecture that I was so passionately arguing for. Um, and you might find some of the words I used in it to be negative, but I meant them all as positive qualities. Uh, for me, they were positive qualities and they included things like anonymity and domestic life and function and program among others. But I have to tell you, I am now less convinced about the word every day, or at least what the word meant to me when I used it in this essay. I think the word has lost much of its meaning. From Henri Lefebvre to Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, understanding, critiquing, and celebrating an architecture of the everyday made a lot of sense through the 20th century. But we are now actually 20% of the way through the 21st century. We're deeper into late stage capitalism. The rising global superpower is China and the world is on fire in the US and elsewhere, both metaphorically and literally, certainly in, out in the West, our West. Uh, and as recent, recent research indicates, we are going to irreversibly cross the 1.5 degree Celsius temperature rise in 2025, which is uh, very soon. So if I were writing the everyday essay now, there would be an explicit insistence on myself on addressing architecture's role in the climate crisis. 
The noted environmentalist Bill McKibben says that most of the momentum destroying our earth is hardwired into the systems that run it. So to change that obviously requires we think differently about how we design buildings. In addition to the environment missing from my essay, so was enough of an explicit emphasis on the city. The environment is an urban issue, of course, but another urban issue is access, which entails the just distribution of resources and the freedom of the city that is fundamental to urban citizenship. Another is the defense of privacy from the multiplication of techniques of surveillance and the manipulation that prevents us from freely forming our sense of self. Now, Michael Sorkin wrote that in 2003, and that was before much of the tracking technology we live with today was even developed. He was right. And finally, we have to acknowledge that valuable living cultural physical ecologies have to be preserved because the use of public space as a place of expression must be maintained in a way that is safe and just. And finally, or almost finally, I should say, in addition to the environment and urbanism not being mentioned in the essay in any substantive way, neither did I write with enough criticism about the profession itself to acknowledge that the diversity of the profession doesn't begin to reflect the diversity of our society, nor the talents of its many intricate and overlapping cultures. So another thing we must do is acknowledge, acknowledge that architects alone don't determine the built environment. We're part of a large team that includes structural, mechanical, and civil engineers, among others like acousticians, lighting designers, sustainability consultants, wayfinding consultants and preservationists, landscape architects, botanists, environmentalists, and urban planners, regional planners, transportation engineers, professions with similar issues about, of underrepresentation of women and minorities. And all that big long list, uh, that's before the building is even built because then there is the very complex choreography of construction which includes skilled teams of people who can form and pour concrete, frame with timber or steel, plumb, wire, waterproof, tile, paint. So who gets to do this? How do we train them and how do we pay them? How much? How much do they respect what we do as architects and designers or we them? And how do we change that? And of course, who decides what can and can't be done? How tall can a building be? What use type? can go where, where can you build, what can you build, and who do we build for? And that brings me to justice. Um, built environment social justice is what I've been calling it today. Beyond the profession, the larger societal issue, particularly in the United States, but also throughout the world, is one of social justice. When I was in graduate school studying urban planning, for instance, we were taught zoning was good. It was what prevented the tannery from being built next to the elementary school, for instance. We were also taught about the bias and exclusionary zoning, but nowhere near in depth enough where we taught about the deep intrinsic racial discrimination written into zoning codes and more mortgage legislations among other things. So I asked the question, what as a practitioner should one do? Because it's one thing to state something like this that I just did as a teacher and an educator and an occasional essayist, but vastly another to try to figure out how to roll it into practice. What we share, I hope you have a big enough screen to see this wherever you might be watching this talk, students, partners, architects and offices and many of you, we share the architect's brain, and I hope you find this illustration uh, from Point Supreme funny, particularly after all the serious stuff I was just talking about. But amusing as it is, there is no mention whatsoever of the responsibility we have and of all of the things we actually need to do. I think we all love the mess that creativity can produce as well as appreciate the order and clarity of rigorous organization and systems. 
But as I said, there's more. Because the responsibilities of the built environment are to all people, and our responsibilities for the greater good is more pressing than it has ever been. So as architects, it must be the built environment re really large uh, that we decide to take on. So I'm going to propose we call what is necessary now an architecture of the greater good. And that includes the issues I've mentioned, as well as engagement, plurality, and inclusion. So I thought in that context, I would show you some of the work of my firm to talk about how we're trying, and nobody is perfect at this for sure, how we're trying uh, to do that now. Sometimes it can be simple. You as an architect can feel fulfilled about projects that look good, of course, and also more importantly, uh, do good. So encouraging a client who is building a house to set you know, real significant sustainability goals and note that there are, that those sustainability goals are actually an essential aspect of good design. Maybe as part of that, use only locally sourced materials, uh, which are not only a sustainability approach, but also I think kind of deeply psychologically ties a business to its site. Try to design new buildings with a richness of surface detail to help revitalize a small downtown, almost like a reward for walking, you know, emphasize walkability, uh, make somebody want to go up and actually touch the building. Um, and come up with great design ideas for old buildings, maybe buildings like this one that community fought for decades to save and you help them put it to a new use. Or do the same for an old underutilized former factory that not only puts the building to a new and unexpected use, but brings life to a part of the city that had for years had streets empty of people and activity. It's great to work for mission-driven organizations that support communities uh, as we did here in the facilities for GMHC here in New York, or for the Wallace Foundation whose mission is to foster improvements in learning and en enrichment for disadvantaged children and the vitality of the arts for everyone. Or build libraries in small towns where they function not just as a place to borrow books, but also as town centers where older citizens might go to read during the day and where children go after school to do homework and where community organizations can hold meetings in the evening. Or even design bookstores because they too become gathering places as well as being a necessary part of reinforcing the strength of local businesses and active retail street frontage. And definitely do pro bono work. In this case, we did a project for an organization called Chop Chop Kitchen that teaches children and families about real food, healthy eating, and meal preparation. All that feels right and good, um, if never enough. So I thought I would show you a few images uh, and projects where I go into um, a bit more detail and talk about the ways in which we try as architects to contribute, to be part of the undertaking that is making an architecture of the greater good. So I'm going to start with an old, uh, with the conversion of an old New York City public school. Uh, this is a picture from way back when, when it was in use as a school and when the elevated train still ran on First Avenue. The building was later abandoned by the Board of Education and reoccupied by arts groups, sort of guerrilla style actually, uh, in the early 1970s. Um, and that elaborate cornice um, had been removed long ago. Today it houses four arts organizations, Mabu Mines, which is an avant-garde theater company, Performance Space New York, which is one of New York's oldest off-Broadway off theaters. Painting Space 122, which is devoted to arts education, artist in residence studios, and gallery space. Movement Research, which is a dance studio. And it has one health organization in it, the Alliance for Positive Change, 
uh, which works with the HIV positive community in the neighborhood. Now our idea on the, was that our addition would have presence, but not too much physical mass. Um, it's clad in, clad in, excuse me, perforated stainless steel meant to shimmer a little bit in the daylight with varying levels of transparency and not look at all like the 125 year old brick that it abuts. The addition is placed in a tiny indentation that the original building had. Uh, you can locate that where it is by finding the elevator in this plan. And the addition allows for an at-grade entrance, which the building did not have, an elevator, which it did not have, proper bathrooms, and proper 21st century fire stair, which the building definitely did, did not have. Um, this is uh, an image of the new lobby, uh, which is the first lobby the building ever had as well. And what we did throughout the project was to try to relocate or keep in location found parts of the building wherever we could, like this old stained glass uh, window, which we put above the new door. And in the same space, we decided to show rather than conceal the new steel structure necessary to reinforce the old building. The idea was that we would keep all of it simple so that it could be about the artists and their work and not about the architecture, make them and the work, creative work going on in the building be the foreground. Some of the former classrooms are painting studios for the artist residency program. And interestingly enough, every one of the arts organizations all said to us, uh, don't make it too, too nice. And what they were saying in effect was, don't erase the history. It's what makes this building special. And they were referring not only to their history, but the building's history. And, and we listened to them. You can see in this new theater from Abu Mines on the left-hand side, an old column that we intentionally left exposed. And we cleaned and repaired the old, the old as you can see in this stair rail, and then contrasted it uh, with the new, um, which you see in the stairwell going up to the new floor that we added. I, feel very strongly that one does not imitate the past and one should never make any fake old um, ever. So one of the things we did was raise the roof to create column free high ceiling space for performance. It might sound counterintuitive to put the biggest and most public space in the building for the biggest uh, organization in the building but it was the most economic approach to creating column free space. And it had the added benefit of bringing visitors through the other creative activities that were happening on the other floors uh, when they came to the building. So here is that new large theater. It's very raw space, um, which is perfect for the kind of experimental theater groups that Performance Space New York invites. So you see here, uh, set for the interactive piece called Farsa by Renata Lucas. And you see here the set for Brujas. They're an urban skateboarding coalition. They essentially choreograph skateboarding. Uh, this is a rehearsal uh, shot. Their work is absolutely fantastic. Um, and what you see here, that addition that I showed you before, it, it allows light out at night, which indicates activity inside uh, to the neighbors and to the city beyond. And you know, I mentioned the cornice at the beginning uh, that was removed. We did a replacement cornice, um, which is a bench and a guardrail for the roof deck, and also the site of an art installation by Monica Getz called Inhale, Exhale. It's, am I not playing it here? Yes, yeah, let me figure out how to play this. I can't play it, I really apologize. Um, oh well, the lights go on and off. I'll skip that, the film doesn't seem to wanna to play right now, but the cornice pulses in terms of activity going on in the, in the building. My apologies for not being able to show that. Similarly, many years ago, we created a new facility uh, for the Yale School of Art. 
In this case, we radically transformed a much newer a mid 20th century building that was designed by Louis Kahn. He's actually much better known in New Haven for the Yale University Art Gallery and the Yale Center for British Art uh, than he was for New Haven's Jewish Community Center, which originally opened in 1954. It was later sold to developers in the 1980s, but they did nothing with the property and Yale eventually purchased it in the 90s when it was a water soaked, essentially a ruin with all the flashing piping, wiring and paneling stolen in the intervening decades. And we were hired to turn that ruin into an art school. We decided to organize each department and the black box theater that is included for the drama school around a central signature space that would give identity and allow for gathering and shared events. We can see that one of the themes and what I'm talking about is one of uh, the architect's responsibility to community. Graphic design was placed in what had been an old gymnasium where we added a mezzanine for the student work area, added skylights for more daylight and exposed the original trusses which had been hidden in the old gym ceiling. The photography crit space central to that department was in the former swimming pool with the new floor at about where the fourth four foot deep watermark had been. And you can see that kind of unmistakable green pool tile wall behind the pinup wall and ramp that we added. And we reconceived what had been an auditor kind of a school like auditorium into a flat floored omnidirectional experimental theater for the school of drama shown in this image of a contemporary staging of As You Like It. And you can see those spaces in this section. They include a drawing studio and what had been multiple kindergarten classrooms on the lower right, and the theater and gym on the main floor, which is half a level up from the street. And on the upper right are the shared undergraduate painting studios, which are at the north windows of the Khan building. But you can see the circulation is along the window, so that too becomes a communal space. And this is space that was opened up from what had been a series of small offices. The graduate painting students each get their own studios uh, in a new building, which we designed uh, on the immediate adjacent property. We also gave that building a two story crit space that serves as its central organizing and gathering space. One overlooks it on entering, possibly seeing one's classmates in a crit and being able to join in that conversation. There's a shared space between the two buildings that has become the art school's courtyard. Uh, the Dean of the art school would probably be unhappy if I pointed out that people smoke there, but such is the life of an artist. Um, and I have to say, despite that slightly snarky remark, because the architecture students smoke too, it is always a treat to design an art school. It's a place where creativity is supported, supported and nurtured and where gathering and exchanging ideas are key parts of the program and mission. More than a decade later, we got to dramatically rethink and expand another art school, this one in upstate New York, designed by I.M. Pei in the 1960s. He, along with his partners, Harry Cobb and James Freed, used modernist planning and a distinctive design language to create what I would describe as a remarkably graphic idea for a campus for the State University of New York. The campus authorities didn't stick to the, to the rigor of the original plan, as you can see from the model to the uh, photograph on the right. In the center in a rectangle is the Rockefeller Arts Center, uh, abutting a parking lot rather than their idyllic trees. And we were hired to do a 60,000 square foot addition and a renovation and fix all the problems. This is the architectural character of the campus, monumental board formed concrete buildings and the Rockefeller Art Center is on the right, it was completed in 1968. This is the site plan today. The back of the building is now the front, done through our addition, which is drawn here in red. It added a new entrance and gave the building a front at the point of arrival where other new buildings and all that parking had previously been added. 
This is the new entrance. It even offers protection from the snow, which Pay's building certainly did not do. And we thought a lot about how the new building would relate to the existing. We did a lot of program studies. We wanted to respect Pay's palette as well as express the creativity of the activities within rather than hide them. In fact, on the right side of this image where the concrete wall is perforated are work yards off the student sculpture studios. We thought a lot about light breaking across the surface and how to calibrate not only the texture of the concrete, but also the relationship of metal and glass, kind of inverting Pay's material palette, more glass, more surface texture, and less concrete. So we gave the facade depth to decrease solar gain and provide the texture I was just describing and some rhythm, which was in contrast to the smoothness of the 1960s vertical surfaces. You can see those on the left in this image. I went to art school and loved the directness and non-preciousness of art making spaces. This is a sculpture studio. This is the new welding foundry. And this is the new daylit ceramic studio. And these are, they're working spaces. They're not vulnerable and they foreground the work, not the building. And as at Yale and at uh, PS, the old PS122, we saved what mattered. So here, what you see in the middle between the two photographs is a door frame where generations of acting students signed their names on the concrete. We had to save that obviously. And we also made Pay's long, relentless exterior wall, which is the concrete on the left side of the left image, part of a much more dynamic interior, uh, celebrating what he had done, but contextualizing it and making it usable. We added a new big dance hall, sorry, getting ahead of myself, that is a space for uh, practice, uh, also for instruction and can be used for public performance. With the idea being that with open and lit spaces like it, the building really becomes a marker of all the performance study, art, fabrication that happens on this campus. Sometimes a project has a mission that is more emphatic, although I don't want to diminish uh, the importance of arts in the subjects I was talking about earlier. Um, but for the women's building, there's a little backstory here too. We won a design competition to renovate what had originally been a YMCA designed by Shreve Lamb and Harmon, no less. They're the architects of the Empire State Building for sailors uh, who were in town when their ships were in New York Harbor. Unfortunately, as shipping in New York Harbor changed, Siemens House closed and that building, sort of understated deco building, became a New York State prison for women. It also became a forbidding and foreboding place. Smaller wired windows were set in larger openings and prison doors with slots for the passage of food were added. Absolutely horrible. And when the west side flooded during Hurricane Sandy, the prison was evacuated and the building was left to rot even further. And the state of New York eventually allowed organizations and real estate developers to put forward ideas for the property. An organization, a foundation actually proposed something they called the Women's Center or the Women's Building, a place for NGOs, foundations, organizations, all devoted to addressing issues of women and girls globally. The state selected them and they in turn held the design competition, which as I said, we won. And this drawing was part of our competition entry. And once the project started, we participated in all sorts of events to draw the public into a conversation 
of what a building like this should do, what should it be. So there were street festivals and all sorts of events, including ones led by women who had been incarcerated in the building. We met with them to hear from them directly about their experiences uh, so we could understand what parts of the building needed to be saved to tell its history and what parts should be destroyed or replaced or erased so that no one would ever have to experience what they did. So we did pro programming sessions with groups and organizations, and we did a lot of listening. It felt right to put a mission-driven organization with a program like this one into a neighborhood of art galleries and luxury housing. Our design added to the existing building as well as completely reconsidered how its internal spaces would be used. Spaces for gathering, meeting, teaching, broadcasting, job training, daycare, hosting conferences and events. The most important idea was that it be accessible and transparent in its, in its activities, exactly the opposite of what it had been before. And I would say that there is an optimism and re it, there is an optimism in rethinking and reusing these kinds of buildings. The kind of optimism I believe uh, cities really need these days. Now, sometimes we do wholly new buildings, but in them we continue to care about mission experience and community. And this is a building we recently completed in Indianapolis for a division of the Cummins Corporation, which is an engineering and manufacturing company in Indiana. They bought an entire city block on Market Street in downtown Indianapolis, three blocks from the War Memorial that is the center of the city, which is the circle on the plan in the left. And you can see the building from the War Memorial but you get a much clearer sense of what it is like as you turn the corner and see it from the south where it opens to a park that we created. This is the light filled building lobby. It has an entrance on Market Street as well as an entrance from the park. And in the center of this image, you can see a staircase that goes to the second floor. The top of those stairs is at the center left in this plan which is where access from parking meets those coming up from the lobby. And the idea is that everyone arrives at the same place, you can get food here, coffee in the morning, and a training center with meeting rooms and classrooms. You can see that uh, double the staircase in this section, and it sets the spatial idea for the rest of the building. Three double height areas that connect people visually and socially. The folks at Cummins call them the hubs, and they are connected by a mural. Each of the three hubs has a different staircase. Uh, those two create identity within the building. Here's a closer look at the stadium seating staircase, which connects floors seven and eight. This stair we called the pretzel stair during design connects floors five and six. Uh, each floor is designed so the more collective and communal work areas are close to the center and the quieter, more focused work areas are at the ends. And the straight stair with the open kitchen beneath it connects floors three and four. And the other thing you can see here is that these spaces are daylit from the south. You also see in this image uh, the lower section of the mural. A lot of engineers work in this building and they liked the scientific calibration of the facade. The narrow floor plate allows the building to be completely daylit uh, and environmental as well as quality of work life design decision. But that in turn required passive shading elements, horizontal shades and vertical fins that vary in depth depending on their location, as well as some opaque panels that help, help increase insulation at the envelope and also provide places for solid walls and privacy and certain elements of the program. So our sustainability consultant on this project, Atelier 10, collaborated very closely with us and helped us achieve a significant, really meaningful reduction in energy consumption. And the creation of the park, which was possible because 
of the vertical building a narrow floor floor plate, blah, excuse me, narrow floor plate left a lot more of the site open. The park also handles all of the site's stormwater and covers its own irrigation needs. And to get back to art, uh, the mural that I mentioned earlier is also visible from the park. So shared with everybody, not just the people who work in the building. In effect, the shared experience occurs at different scales and immediacy, but it is definitely shared. When we started this project several years ago, this end of Market Street was virtually empty, but there's been a lot of new residential development since, and people are moving to downtown since the building opened. And while we considered the experience of the employees, it really also mattered to us and it mattered to Cummins. They were a mission, they're a bit for-profit business, but they are a mission-driven company. It mattered to them that the project provides something for the city, for downtown office workers, for residents alike. So as I said, by organizing the program vertically, we were able to create more space for the park. So we collaborated with the landscape architect, David Rubin of Land Collective. You see an image of the park here right after the plants went in and it is now extraordinarily lush, very satisfying and used heavily, whether for lunch breaks or civic events. And I would imagine used even more heavily now uh, as, uh, as people gather outside uh, during, during COVID. One of my favorite moments in this project was when one of my partners was on site at the end of construction and recorded for his young child back in New York, the sound of a songbird in the newly opened park. I feel we as architects all have a responsibility, responsibility to build in cities and do buildings in cities that take their responsibilities very seriously as well. We are currently building, not in a city, uh, two new residential colleges at Princeton where they are expanding the undergraduate student body by a thousand students. That's a big change for them, a mission driven one as well. The two new residential colleges are comprised of eight connected buildings that stretch across a sloping 11 acres at the southern end of Princeton's historic campus. It is our goal to give it a carefully choreographed series of interior and exterior routes that continue the pattern of, I don't know if any of you have been to Princeton's campus, but it's essentially open courtyards. It's an open courtyard campus, uh, this being a riff on that that's more modern and transparent and welcoming. It's exactly consistent with the spirit of making Princeton open to more students. We're using brick and wood and metal on the exteriors and wood and color on the interiors with lots of visibility between levels and spaces. The two dining halls, one for each college, each open to their own courtyard, one more wooded and one more orchard-like. And they also share a lower courtyard between them. You can see that in the middle of this site section sketch. That's also visible to people walking through this part of the campus. So you're slowly making your way down the hill and you can peer into that courtyard and see whether your friends are in the dining hall. In addition to that, each college has a signature space one has a completely flexible theater suitable for dance or for movies. There's also an exterior performance space. It's small and meant for music, poetry, readings, jams, or just hanging out. Construction is well underway, I'm excited to say and uh, the students will be moving in in the fall of 22. So that's pretty soon. Now, this word is pronounced uh, Next Haven and it's an artist residency program in New Haven started by the renowned artist Titus Kafar. Several years ago, I met Titus at the 21C Museum Hotel in Louisville. The owners there collect his work. He and I never met at Yale, 
but we were both glad that we met through 21C because we discovered how our lives overlapped through clients, collectors, institutions, and certain really strongly held beliefs. This is some of his more current work. The one on the left is a print, recently in a show at MoMA PS1 about incarceration. And the one on the right is one of his large paintings. Titus has been featured in the New York Times. This is when he won a MacArthur Genius Award. And that article also referred to the project that I'm about to show you, the Next Haven Project, um, because it connects his work to what he believes about life. Art literally changed Titus's life, and he is working to use art to change the lives of others. Next Haven is located in the Dixwell neighborhood of New Haven, and it provides studio space, gallery and community space, live workspaces for artists, a small jazz performance space, and training and mentorship programs for students from Hill House High School, which is a block, the big, big building that is a block away. Next Haven occupies two abandoned factory buildings, one where medical equipment was made and one where ice cream was made years and years ago. The buildings more recently and sadly had been used to manufacture counterfeit goods and even more sadly uh, as a prostitution. I've discovered I can't show films in this presentation. This is a really brief one, but it's Titus talking about the connection between his work and you saw the historic elements in his work and the idea of adaptive reuse. Initially, we thought we'd retain the entire complex of buildings, but various existing conditions made that more costly and complicated than it was worth. But we also liked the clarity and integrity of keeping the two meaningful original buildings and building two new ones, which is what you can see in this model. The one at the back and the one in between the old ones are in the lighter color as shows in this model. On the ground floor, there are 12 large artist studios. Um, and on the left in the old test tube factory, uh, there's a large room for events and shared activities. The entry is in the center in one of the new buildings with the gallery behind it. The jazz space is in the basement along with workshops and other facilities for the artists. Next Haven has its second group of artists and residents there now. And interestingly enough, more people applied to that, their residency program than applied to the Yale School of Art this year. The idea is that the facility is open and welcoming. It's really exactly how we envisioned it. I was with them last week in the building on, on the left, uh, the old factory space, uh, with the skylight it has become the great hall that I described and an in installation space. This photograph shows it with some of the high school interns. And just last week, uh, Titus and I spoke to a group of the artists in, in residence. They really managed to make the studio spaces their own for the year they are in residence. There are various types of studios and that aligns well with the artists who do really various types of work. And I am happy to say that the gardens in front are starting to grow and by next year they too should be as lush as that park in Indianapolis. Now, as you can tell, uh, we like to work for organizations whose missions appeal to us. Sometimes these projects fall, fall outside uh, the scope of standard commissioned architect client relationship. And that too, I think can be a part of the greater good. We host art exhibitions at our offices for artists whose work we find meaningful. This is the artist Kiki Smith. We're not showing her work. She actually came to see the work of the young artists on the wall. Much younger artists here, uh, we try to we occasionally run kids workshops. This one's at the Cooper Hewitt, but we do them in local schools as well. We try to be engaged and engaging well beyond the world of design insiders. We also try to acknowledge other issues, issues that architecture can't address, like finding a cure for breast cancer, say. So we participate in fundraising uh, on issues we care about that are outside of our area of expertise. 
I would really like architects and architecture to be less intimidating right now. So people, people feel that they can engage in conversation about and also share in the actual shaping of, of the built environment. Toward that end, I have appeared on podcasts and on Ina Garten's Barefoot Contessa TV show, Eating Well and Arguing for Good Design. So, uh, Michael is funny, I am not. Um, but that was, that was a good podcast to do too. Um, so I would say if I were writing the essay now, I'd use different words. The list of adjectives for the greater good would include unique without arrogance, original without pretension, honorable, ethical, truthful, wise, compassionate, Still ornery, because ornery is good, so you can argue for new meaning and expression in design. Yet always considerate of others and open-minded, which means being open to new ways of imagining the future, because there are many ways to build. And ask of us architects that we never forget our responsibilities and we don't perpetuate previous wrongdoings. Because I think today, in this horrible year that is 2020, <laughs> we are actually offered a chance to do something genuinely new uh, coming out of this current burning shambles. Um, I don't think these are new challenges and they are definitely difficult ones to overcome, but I really do believe that we as architects and designers, we are the primary contributing authors of the built environment and we need to address this stuff. We're here together, we need to work together to design and build better buildings, spaces, cities, systems, and regions. I I think even in addition to that, we should be talking about beauty, most importantly. Beauty is something that I believe everyone is entitled to have access to. We as architects should design to engage a diverse community, create beauty, and offer joy through buildings, great buildings, and also great spaces. I think they can be pluralistic and messy, they need to be generous to all and to commit to the future of a livable planet. This new architecture, this architecture for now, this greater good has to promise to be generous to all, be part of a livable planet, as I said. We're not gonna be the ones, us architects and designers, to find the cure for COVID, nor will we be, nor will we be the ones writing a more just legislation although I encourage some of you to run for office if you so wish. But I do really believe that with our talent and our vision and with our willingness to work with others across disciplines, with that commitment to create an architecture of the greater good, we can make the planet a better place and contribute to a more just built world as messy and unfinished as that work might be, it can always, always be on its way to beauty, joy, and the greater good. So thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. So if there are any questions out there, you could put them into the chat or there's a Q&A as well. All right, I've actually, Deborah, I've got a question for you here. Um, so Dean Burke, thank you for speaking this evening and thank you for all you do for our world and profession. As an architect and as an urban dweller, has COVID changed your perspective on modernism in general and urbanism in particular? How might this affect your future work? Um, I, it has not changed my opinion on modernism and I think modernism is a pretty hard thing to talk about where a hundred years past some people's version of the beginning of modernism with a capital M, 200 years past other people's version. And I don't know if you're talking about historic modernism, European modernism, trim down stuff that's all painted white or what. So no, it hasn't changed. What I like about cities are cities that are not all modern or all old, but a palimpsest of all that happens over time, even like at PS122 where, you, where there's a historic building that speaks to uh, that's on the Lower East Side, it was an immigrant community. That public school educated the children of immigrants in the 19th century and early 20th century. And now it's an arts center. 
with a modern edition, I guess modern, I'll, I'll use small and modern. Um, that's what I like about cities uh, and what I think cities should look like and what I feel about modern architecture to answer part one of your question. Part two about COVID, what I'm seeing in New York, I don't know what you're seeing in St. Louis, um, is, and I hope we get through this as the weather gets colder, but people's creativity about using the outdoors and staying far apart from each other and using what the city offers. So near where I live, there's a fair amount of scaffolding on buildings that are being renovated. And people, I think, people who work in gyms who used to give workout instruction are using scaffolding to have people do chin-ups and pull-ups and tie those stretchy. So when I go for my walk in the morning, I see these trainers out there with people pulling their elastic bands and lifting weights on the scaffolding. And I think, okay, that's a great use of space. Or even early in the pandemic, when nobody in New York at least was going outside uh, and everybody would lean out their windows at 7 p.m. and bang on their pots and pans, which to my mind, it was a thank you to um, the first line protection people, the ambulance drivers and the doctors and nurses. But it was also a way to say, well, we can't even go in the street right now, but we can make it ours by filling it with noise. So I think we're learning how to use our cities in creative ways, closing off streets and allowing people to gather six feet apart uh, because the sidewalks are too narrow. Um, that I hope we bring with us when COVID's over. I don't know if I answer, fully answered your question. I've got another question from uh, Marianne Lazarus. Uh, thanks for an inspirational talk. I'm interested if your own definition of beauty has changed, and if so, how? My own definition of? Beauty. Beauty. Um, you know, I think in some ways we each define our own beauty broadly. Uh, for me, beauty occurs when sun reflects off a building in the morning. This is a, I mean, there's the beauty of walking on the beach or picking a flower, right? no, no argument there, or seeing a puppy dog play. Right? <laughs> there's that stuff, the sort of the stuff of life or seeing a toddler learn how to walk. Um, but the beauty, the beauty of the built environment, uh, I think is, is reflected in material deployment and composition, but also responsibility, sympathy to context without being copycat, uh, understanding that the sun plays across the surface of a building all day and all year, and that alone, shadow on material can, can give delight I think all of, I think we should be generous these days in our definition of beauty. It is not solely Michelangelo's David. There are many, many, many forms of beauty uh, and we should welcome them. All right. Well, actually I, I have a question for you. <laughs> okay, Jan. <Jennifer. laughs> um, in, in a way, I think your lecture that kind of encompass this question, but how has your practice influenced your teaching? Um, that is a good question. I would say in I'm not teaching right now because being dean is a pretty time consuming along with practicing. <laughs> but when I was teaching, I feel that what I learned from practice is to listen rather than preach, to engage in dialogue, to be respectful of the work of others and try. So I feel as though we function that way in the office. Listen to, design is not done democratically. You don't get to vote on whether you like something or not, but it is done through the exchange of ideas. And I, that happens here in the office and it uh, happens at school as well. Respect. I, I can't sing, so I'm not going to do that Aretha Franklin thing, but respect writ large uh, matters at the office and at school. Um, so got a question on the Q&A. What aspect of architecture 
comes out best through academia and teaching as opposed to working in the office? <laughs> well, you, you don't have to build. Um, <laughs> no. uh, I, I've been on a couple of AIA juries recently, so this is not about yours, but that one that I was on on the West Coast, and they had a big unbuilt category, and my fellow jurors and I, who were well-known architects from around the country, agreed that the bar for unbuilt is higher than the bar for built. So we were really, really, really um, strict on what we thought was award-winning unbuilt work. And in a way, I feel that schoolwork is the same. The bar is really high, but that also means there's a lot of room for experimentation and testing ideas that won't be built and, and therefore can test other, other limits um, rather than just the limits of budget, site, and buildability. Okay, I've got a, another question for you from Allie Abrams. Um, thank you, Dean Burke, uh, for your moving and inspiring lecture. Uh, who are your heroes? <laughs> uh, people ask that question, particularly when I was a young architect, that question got asked, asked a lot. And I think people expect the answer to be, oh, I don't know, Saarinen, you know, or Louis Kahn. Uh, and I think from a design position, those are my heroes. But in, in some ways right now, and you saw a couple of pictures of, of my friend Titus Kafar, uh, the artist, I would describe what he's doing as a hero. He is one of my heroes. Uh, and this is separate from healthcare workers and the people who are dealing with, with the immediate crisis we're facing. Titus is the hero to me because he has taken the prestige and the money that has come from his success and he is sharing it. And, but he's not just giving it away, he's functioning as a role model and setting up um, a facility where people can learn how to make art a part of their life. That art is not an exclusive path for only the privileged. Anybody can be an artist and Titus is helping make that possible. Uh, so I, I don't know if hero is the right word. I admire and respect him enormously. I think that's where I'm looking for my heroes these days, people who can change other people's lives. I've got a question from Robert Kahn. What place do you Robert think Kahn. theory has in school? Say that again. What place do you think theory has in school? Well, theory is that word like modern, you know, capital T, small t, whose theory, you know, is it theory taught by Tony Vidler or theory taught back in the old days by somebody else or theory taught looking forward. The, I think theory is valuable in school. Theory, small t, taught across the curriculum because it requires Student, the students who are on their way to becoming architects to understand how to explain their work in the context of others who have explained architectural thought and impact over time and shape what they're doing. The built environment has a long continuum. Buildings don't vanish overnight. So to place your work, not only physically, but also intellectually and historically on the intellectual project, that is architecture. That is the value of teaching theory. Yeah, I've got a question from Nathaniel Nelson. If you were to label yourself as something other than an architect, how would you describe your job? Well, my job? Uh, I don't see myself as having a job. It's funny, I, uh, I describe myself as an architect, as a mother, as a New Yorker, uh, as an occasional long distance swimmer, um, and as a citizen of the world. Yeah, no jobs. <laughs> okay, I've got another question from uh, Frank Rosario. 
Over the course of your career, would you say that the expectations of users slash owners vis-a-vis -vis their engagement with buildings is changing? For example, their comfort levels, their participation in active manipulation of elements to modify their environment? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I think, um, and I think it's good. I think it doesn't always make clients meet meetings easier. And I suppose there are still architects out there who function as sort of demanding divas. Not That's not a gender description. Uh, who say my way or I'm gone. But to my mind, this is good. You know, those images I showed of listening sessions, um, that would be part one. And then part two would be designing spaces that I guess have a nimbleness about them as spaces so that the user can change how it's working for them at that time, whether that's about physical comfort or about use. I mean, God, we're all experiencing it now. We wish, we wish our houses maybe were more nimble since we're working, eating, working out, spending time with family. You know, there's a lot going on in your house. You're looking for spaces that are less prescriptive and more adaptable. So you can do Thanksgiving dinner and also three people in a family can be working on their laptops at the same time. Uh, I would say this new, these new expectations of clients, users, owners, they're good. Okay. Getting well, close to dinner time for me. I yeah, to <laughs> you know, I'm thinking this, this might be a good time to um, to wrap it up. Uh, it was a, a incredibly a great lecture, Deborah. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Chandler. Yeah, um, and I guess you know, a lot of people in the audience are probably going to uh, see you again in uh, two days for the uh, <laughs> awards <laughs> to kind of see what's happening. Uh, here in St. Louis. So, you know, thank you for the lecture. Thank you for being part of the awards ceremony as well and heading the jury on that. It's, um, it's, it's really important uh, to have someone like you coming uh, and sharing your ideas with us here. So. My pleasure. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.